Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. And there St. Paul says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but do not quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Now, I believe there's a broader principle here in this text than simply beyond whether we should be meat eaters or vegetarians. We're told right here in verse one, welcome him and do not quarrel over opinions. Now in the Greek here it means not passing judgment on opinions. Now we as Christians, we as reformed Christians in the first quarter of the 21st century, we have a lot of opinions. Every generation has a lot of opinions. And a lot of times they're contextualized to the issues that are going on in that generation. And it's good to hold that what you believe is good and right according to the word of God. But we need to be careful in quarreling over opinions. What kind of opinions do we have? How about Christian nationalism? What does that mean? How is it to be applied? Head coverings. Christian education, how to educate your kids. Whether or not you watch R-rated movies, whether you enjoy cigars or pipes. We need to be careful not to be quarreling over opinions. Now here we have the issue of food, and a Jewish Christian would have had quibbles over how meat was prepared. Now imagine you're a first century Jew. You're used to and steeped in all of your life in the law of God. Meat has to be prepared a certain way. The blood needs to be drained a certain particular way. It cannot be done in a way which gives obeisance to idols. But now you've become a Christian. And you've seen that the law of God has been subsumed up into the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's freedom there. And some Christians who've come out of a Jewish background are okay eating meat sacrificed to idols. Now, this is not the case where there's this temple here and they're sacrificing these animals right here and you go up there and participate in that particular ceremony. But in the first century, in a pagan culture, the meat that you got more than likely would have some association with sacrifice to idols. So the cow would have been brought into the temple, sacrificed, and then it would have been taken out to the marketplace. And so a Jewish Christian would have had a hard time overcoming this obstacle to the point where he becomes a vegetarian. This is not a vegetarian because they're thinking about cruelty to animals. This is not vegetarianism because of health reasons in the modern sense. But here we got someone conflicted about whether this piece of meat has been sacrificed to an idol. Now St. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some through former association with idols eat meat as really offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care, this, this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block for the weak. And I can give you an example of something like this that might come up in your lives. You're witnessing the faith to someone who's Muslim. In fact, when I went to Pakistan, the Christians there do not eat pork. In fact, they have an aversion to it. Now, if we went, hey man, come on, you're free in Christ. Eat some bacon. Have some of this ham and sausage. It might really offend them. It goes against everything they believed all their lives. Don't lord it over your brethren in this situation. Verse four, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, friends, I want to say this. We've got a lot of opinions as Reformed Christians. We've got a lot of precise doctrinal views on things. But we've got to know the times. We're living in a time and place where there are bigger fish to fry. And so when you have your opinion on something, and again, I want to say this, it's good and right to have opinions. But when you're thinking about going and pressing your views on others, I want you to ask yourself two questions. Is this the essential content of the faith? 
Now, we as liturgical and traditional Christians recite the Nicene Creed each week. And so anyone coming off the street in here who affirms those basic essentials of the faith is your brother and sister in Christ. So take care not to crush them. And the second question you want to ask is, does this break down the essential content of the faith? Going into verse 5. One person esteems one day better than another while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Now, this text here is not talking about alternative days for worship. I've seen this text used by various churches, normally large, mega churches that want to make everything as comfortable as possible for Christians. And so they'll say, hey, come to church on Thursday. The text says we can go any day. It doesn't matter what day you honor, then you can have the whole weekend free. This text is not talking about that. In fact, I want to say this. As far as possible, Unless you're in a situation near a prison, for example, where you've got a bunch of people that have to work on Sunday, you may create an alternative service for them. But as a general rule, we worship on the Lord's Day. Why? Because the church has always done that. Why? Because it's when Jesus rose from the dead the first day of the week. So what is this talking about? It's talking about Jewish high holy days. Again, imagine you're a Christian who has come out of Judaism. You've got these high holy days that your entire worldview revolves around. Three times a year, you need to present yourself at the temple of God. You've been doing this since the day you were born, and suddenly you see that all is fulfilled in Christ, and you're trying to make sense of it. And some of your Christian brethren are saying, hey, no big deal, don't worry about these holy days anymore. And you haven't come to that place of maturity yet. You shouldn't be the one going and bullying people about changing their holy days. Going on to verse 7. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. I want to say this, friends, life in the church, life in the kingdom is not what our culture says. Our culture says it's all about me. Our culture says my opinion counts more than anybody else. Life in the kingdom is not about me and my preferences, but is about us. And Christ has died for us. So pursue peace. Verse 10, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Each of us will give an account of himself to God to God. Now, the unbeliever is going to be judged on the last day. The thrones will be set. And guess what? You're going to play a role in that. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, the saints will judge angels, and the saints, the holy ones, are you and I, Christians, chosen out by God. The saints will judge the angels, and the saints will judge the world. The judgment seat will be set And those who have not believed in Christ will be judged, and they will be cast into eternal fire. But guess what? You will be judged as well. You will not be judged in order to have judgment of eternity placed upon your head, but rather, what have you done with so great of salvation? What have you done with the faith among your brothers and sisters in Christ? Those people drinking wine on social occasions they really irritate me. I can't believe they educate their children that way. Well, here's what you need to do, friends. When you see someone doing something different than you, you need to accept the fact that we're all finite. 
that we're sinners saved by grace. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different family situations that we came out from. And don't assume that you've got a bead on the exact truth. So friends, if someone's doing something different than you're doing, in a way that you wouldn't do it, back off the lens a little bit and ask the question, is there fruit there? If there's fruit there, then maybe that's a good way to do it for somebody else, perhaps not yourself. So back off. But if there's sin there, And if that thing they're doing is causing sin, then you've got a responsibility as a brother or sister in Christ to speak to your brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll all stand before the judgment seat as Christians to give an account for how we lived in the body of Christ. Verse 13, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide to never put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother the way of the brother. This is a big motif in the scriptures. The way, it's a road. It's a walk that you're on. The way that you're going and the walk that you're taking is our Christian lives. It's what we're doing in time and space. Let us make it a habit to cause our brethren to walk well. Going on to verse 14. I know I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Now friends, don't assume that everyone thinks like you. I think this is a common human problem. No matter where you go in the world, people have their opinions on things. They're very contextualized. I think the thing about Americans, though, is we don't think they're contextualized. We think that our opinions are the opinion. We think that whatever our view on something is the way it's got to be. For example, you shouldn't be eating meat. And so what do you do? You firebomb steakhouses. Stuff like that goes on in our culture because we're so individualistic in our thinking. We gotta take the lens back and realize maybe our view isn't the only view on that thing. Now this is mochi. A lot of you probably know what it is. Some of you might not know what it is. Okay, this is a rice cake. It's steamed sweet rice. You pound it till it gets smooth and you make cakes out of it. Growing up in Japan, mochi's everywhere. I love mochi. In fact, it's the number one confection in Japan, mochi shops. Some of you had mochi ice cream where they put it inside. Now I just assumed everybody everywhere loves mochi. Who doesn't love mochi? I have a mochi machine and sometimes I make mochi when I have people over on on Sundays and I had a a woman in my church in California who had actually been a missionary in Japan for a number of years and she came over and I, I gave her some mochi and she said, oh no, thank you. And in my head I'm thinking, what? You don't like mochi? What's wrong with you? I said, why don't you like it? She said, you know, it's the texture. It tastes like a big giant booger to me. (laughs) And I thought about it for a minute, and I thought, you know what, if I wasn't raised on this, I can see how you would think that way. (laughs) So don't assume that your view on something is the only way of looking at it. Don't assume that you've got the corner on truth with this peripheral issue, okay? Remember, keep the Nicene Creed and the creeds at the center of your thinking. When you're dealing with your brethren here, And in particular, when you're dealing with your Christian brothers outside these walls and different traditions. Going on to verse 16. So do not let what you regard as good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and is approved by men. Your good here, see this? Don't let your good be spoken of as evil. What's he saying here? Well, your good is your Christian liberty. You've got this thing that you do. You feel that it's something good and wise according to the scripture. Perhaps it's something you feel at liberty to do because of the freedom that you have in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't misuse it and push it on people in such a way that now that thing is spoken of as evil. The kingdom is about righteousness. It's about peace. It's about joy. It's not about your liberty, so pursue peace. Verse 19, 
So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Pursue peace. Pursue mutual upbuilding. Friends, be careful with our reform distinctives. There's people in this room that haven't come to an understanding of those reform distinctives. We live in a time and place where we need each other as Christians. So seek mutual upbuilding, not amongst just us here, but seek the mutual upbuilding of your brothers and sisters in Christ all across this land and across the world. Everything Paul says is clean, but take care of making others to stumble. Verse 22, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. Don't change your life. You don't have to change your views. But take care when you're with others. Take care when you're with others and pursue peace. Be patient with others and don't force others to move beyond their faith. Now, when I was in seminary, I went to Providence Reformed Presbyterian Church. The pastor there was Jeff Myers. You guys have read the book, The Lord's Service. When he got to that church, they had nothing but grape juice in the communion trays. Okay, I would have been like, hey man, we're putting in wine today. But how many feet would I have stepped on? How many of consciences would I have crushed? That's one reason why I like doing church planning, because you start from day one. And I believe that wine and bread are the proper biblical means, and if at all possible, you should have bread and wine. It's the drink of kings. But Jeff waited. He waited for 10 years until everyone was brought on board, until everyone was at the point of saying, can we just put wine in communion now? He was seeking to pursue peace. Last part of verse 23. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Do nothing from doubt. Don't be stampeded or bullied into taking a position. I want to say this. Oftentimes we look at a text like this and we look at it as the stronger brother in Christ is forcing down their view on others. Well, it can happen the other way around, can it not? The person who has scruples on things can also say, oh, I, I, I feel stumbling whenever I'm around you doing this or that. Don't let them bowl you in the other direction as well. So don't be stampeded or bullied into being t taking a position, and don't be a bully. Pursue peace. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, same Apostle Paul here. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything and hold on to the good. Test everything, hold on to the good. Kids, how do you test everything and hold on to the good? You know this. And by doing this, you know the priorities. And by knowing this, you know that you are to pursue peace. And then he says, abstain from every form of evil. And so we're ending this trajectory here as we come to the end of the book of Romans, where we are living sacrifices our lives are not our own. They're in Christ. We owe a debt that can never be repaid. And one way we live is those who have this wondrous debt because the debt of sin and death has been removed from us. It's to pursue righteousness. And how do we pursue righteousness on a practical level? We love one another. We pursue peace with one another. When I was up in Del Norte County in Northern California, the pursuit of Bigfoot is everywhere. Bigfoot maps, Bigfoot keychains, Bigfoot statues at every gas station. The famous Patterson-Gimlin film was made there. This is a home movie of Bigfoot crossing a river back in the 1960s that launched the Bigfoot craze. Everyone up there has a Bigfoot story. Everyone pursues Bigfoot, but no one finds Bigfoot. Peace is something Christians everywhere and at all times should be pursuing. Peace, we're promised in the Word of God, is something that we have in Christ. 
and something unlike Bigfoot that when pursued can be found. St. Paul has shown us this morning in Romans chapter 14 that God wants us to pursue peace. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to know the times and help us to know your word. Help us to stand firmly and unplacably on the essentials of the faith, but help us to be flexible and loving and those who pursue peace with our brethren on our opinions. We pray that you'd bless us in this. May this house be filled with peace and love for your honor and glory. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.